Hey, we are back with another interview with a pro watercolor artist. I'm pretty sure you're going to enjoy this one with my good friend, Lauren McCracken. Let's go to the interview right now. Curious, do you like that hot press paper? Well, Gabriel, that, that's a really a, a lovely question because it, it is one of my favorite subjects. Uh, I, 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 as I said, I've been out there and I visited several paper manufacturers, spent probably more time with the Fabriano mill and in Fabriano and, uh, and the people that import, but not only them, but everything. And what I've learned is that hot press paper was never meant to be a watercolor paper. It was made for the illustration industry. And it was a paper that was uh, formulated to take primarily gouache and tempera. And it is a fabulous medium for that. And I'll point out that uh, I think we're going to see a revival of the use of gouache here over the next couple of years. Just a hint, hint. All right. Here we are with another wonderful interview about watercolor. And I'm so honored to have my good friend, Lauren McCracken, as a guest today on the YouTube podcast about watercolor. Lauren, tell a little bit about you. Uh, about how you got introduced to watercolor and what it is that you do with watercolor. Well, Gabriel, first of all, thank you for inviting me to come and uh, and, and visit with you and and your watercolor friends out there. The the I'm a firm believer: the more we can share this kind of information with people, it'll just raise the quality of watercolor not only in the U.S., but around the world. And this is one of the opportunities where uh, rising tide floats all boats. And so uh, when if it, anything we can do to share good information, it's imperative that we do that. Uh, you know, I, I came to uh, watercolor very late in life. Uh, I was a very successful architect. Uh, and, and everybody looks at my paintings and says, oh, well, that, just, that you know, if he could draw that well. That, well, you know, that, that doesn't explain anything because uh, for the last 43 years, I didn't have a drawing board. I was the marketing guy. And I, I was the guy that flew all the way around the world and got work for the big firms that I was working for. Had a fabulous time. Flew all over the world, as I said. Spent a lot of time in Japan, the Middle East, Europe. It's fabulous. But at age 60... I uh, was living in uh, in Virginia, in Alexandria, Virginia, and uh, I had access to the Torpedo Factory, and that that's a building down on the Potomac River that was a Torpedo Factory during the First and Second World War. Today, it is the home of a bunch of fabulous studios and galleries where the artists paint and show their work. And I used to go down there at least once a month, saw great work, and I kept seeing all these great watercolors. And I thought, well, you know, I didn't get to do watercolor when I was in college. Maybe I, I sh you know, as an architect, I should know how to do watercolor. And, and so I kept asking the, the good watercolorists that I saw, where did they learn? And it turned out the majority of them had learned right there at the little art institute at the Torpedo Factory. And there was a lady there that taught. Her name was Gwen Bragg. And uh, she was very, very popular. And she taught beginning and intermediate watercolor. So I just went down to the office and put my name on the list. It turned out it took me 18 months to get into class. She was so popular. As I have been known to say, I think somebody had to die to make a spot for me. <laughs> but uh, but she, she was a fundamental British transparent watercolor uh, follower and really hit the fundamentals. You had to be able to do a continuous wash, a uh, graded wash. You know, you had to do all of these fundamentals before she would let you advance along in her class. I only got to take uh, about 12 two classes from her. Then I ended up moving to Chicago. Uh, but it really launched me. I mean, she was a great teacher and she was very encouraging. And uh, after that, uh, I ended up in Chicago and uh, took some classes uh, from a fellow that taught uh, adult education at the uh, at the Art Institute uh, in Chicago. Uh, but he was a fabulous watercolorist and he was a realist and he would do a great big painting of 
clothes on the line. And then he would do the texture in the blue jeans stitching along the side. I mean, that was his level of realism. And uh, I took uh, some additional courses, uh, not real, formal courses. I he allowed people to come up on a Tuesday evening to his studio uh, up in Evanston and, and listen to him talk and critique your work and all that. So I did that for a couple of years and learned a lot from him. So that that's how I got to where I am. But in those interim years, uh, like when I was taking these beginner classes with uh, Gwen Brad outside of class, I was doing what the intermediate people were doing because I only knew, I knew I had a short window. So I needed to learn as much as I could. And of course I was working full time. And so after that, my weekends, Saturday and Sunday, I was putting in eight hours of painting every day. And I think that is really the, uh, the message that I think we all ought to, to remind those of, uh, that are starting in this wonderful, uh, medium and those that want to get better. The only way you're going to get better is to paint more and learn about not only the techniques and follow the great painters, but sharpen your technique. Be sure you've got good quality materials and uh, and learn how to use them and then use them a lot. I. I love your story, and there's even so much more of your story, even for watercolor, like. You blew me away where you even went to college to become, you know, an architect. And, you know, if I Googled Lauren McCracken, uh, I get this image of a paint tube that says McCracken Black. And so <laughs> how in a, in a world of today where we have young people wanting to get into fame, you know, how does how does one go from just a beginning painter to having their own <laughs> well, tube of paint. Well, that's very kind of you to ask, but uh, I think that uh, uh, the real answer is you've got to be a participant in the industry of watercolor. And it is difficult in some countries to do that. It's relatively easy in the United States. We have 123 more or less, watercolor societies in the United States. Uh, and you should find your local watercolor society. It may be 60 miles away, but it'll be worth a, a monthly drive to go participate. Here in Fort Worth, we have a watercolor society. It's about 350 people. And every, on the third Monday of every month, we meet nine months out of the year. And at every meeting, there is a two-hour demo by somebody that you need to pay attention to. It could be a local person, but it also could be uh, somebody that was in that week uh, running a workshop for the society. So it could be a, an international star. So I would say that the participation in your local watercolor society, and, and Gabriel, you've been so blessed by being there in San Diego with one of the top watercolor societies. Uh, you know, they're not all as fabulous as San Diego or Houston or, or some of these others, but uh, but every one of them has value. And, and not only... Uh, do you learn, but you also get to share with the people that are there. You know, if, if, if here in, in Fort Worth, if you come at six o'clock, there's always a senior painter there to offer you uh, uh, suggestions, not critiques, just suggestions of what you might do to improve what you're painting, how you're painting, that sort of thing. It's It's not a threatening uh, experience and a lot of people come and, and take advantage of that and then they bring them back in three weeks after they've done everything and and get another critique and then if they've done what they want they put it on the wall and then we uh we award prizes every every month to those people that have brought good paintings so those are the kind of things that happen in watercolor societies and i really really encourage anybody and everybody to find the nearest and and it doesn't have to be an official watercolor societies. I say there are 123 official watercolor societies. There are probably 500,000 uh, people out there that belong to all kinds of other 
art groups. If I were to list, list all of the art-related groups in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, it'd probably be three, 400. So, you know, don't tell me there isn't one uh, close enough to you to take advantage of it. That just means you haven't looked deep enough. That's so true. You know, community is huge. And just to update you, uh, I actually just got drafted to NWS, which is National Watercolor Society. I'm on the board of directors there now. That's but great. Not, that, not about me. People want to know a lot about you. And could you tell us, in your opinion, what is the importance of art materials, paper, paint, and brushes? Because I also know that you have your own brush set. Well, Gabriel, you know me too well. You've hit me in my soft spot. Uh, as an art, I'll, I'll just tell you how I approached it. Uh, when I was uh, uh, taking from Gwen Bragg, I just, I just used whatever he recommended. And at the time, she did recommend the top end products. I'm not even going to name them because they're not top end anymore. And that's the thing people need to focus on, that there just because somebody said that that paper was great in one year, six years from now, that paper may just be terrible because the company got bought, things got changed, uh, the, the, the sizing they're using, all kinds of stuff change over time. And so once you do your research, you can't just stop there. You got to keep doing your research. So uh, I, I, I was having problems with all of a sudden my, the, these fabulous brushes, these expensive brushes I'd been buying started losing hair. And then all of a sudden the, uh, the cerulean uh, tube was squirting out uh, uh, liquids, but there was no uh, uh, ground uh, pigment in there. It was all oxgall. And uh, and then at the same time, the paper I was using just was all of a sudden it wasn't receiving the paint like it was. So I just I just started on a search for and you know because those are your three fundamentals. There are lots more tools we use, but if you don't get those three right, you can't get anything right. So uh going back, I said as an arch architect, if I was going to specify material for somebody, I'd research that roofing material. I'd talk to the manufacturer. I'd want to know what his guarantee was, how he made it. You know, is this is this roof going to going to leak in three years or is it going to, or does, does it have a 20 year warranty and you're going to come back and fix it? So, but we don't think about those things uh, because, you know, you can buy a $3 brush or a $2 brush. You can buy a 50 cent brush, but a 50 cent brush is not going to do the same thing as a uh, $30 Escoda brush. And you can't expect it to, but if you don't know the difference between a 50 cent brush and an Escoda brush, or if you don't even know who Roscoda or Raphael or Da Vinci or all these other, I mean, I could I can name great brush manufacturers for 10 minutes because there are those around the world. And I, I can name paint manufacturers for 10 minutes because they're great manufacturers all over the world. I can I can name you 10 really fine paper manufacturers out there. Uh and so. While I use, and I'll just be right up there with you, you know, I use Daniel Smith uh, paints. I just think they're fabulous. Uh, I, and, and the reason I think they're fabulous, not only are they rich, rich, rich pigments, but they are consistent day after day, tube after tube, year after year. So if I'm going to buy a phthalo blue red shade, today, and I'm going to buy another tube in, in 18 months, I know that that is going to be exactly the same color. And that is not true of many paint manufacturers out there. The, the less expensive they are, the more prone they be they are to not having that kind of consistency. So what I did back then is I just went and knocked on the doors of these people. I, you know, I went to Seattle and and had John Cogley, the man that owns the company, sit down with me. And I said, John, what makes your paint so great? Why should I use it? And he took me back in the lab and showed me how they have scientists and how they they do two runs of manufacturing a year. They have three scientists that test 
every load of paint, every tube of paint, they hold back tubes of paint for years. So if something goes wrong, you can get in touch with them and they can go back and find, is it a fundamental issue or is it something you're doing that, that is changing how it is? And there aren't, in the end, there aren't very many manufacturers that have that kind of support. You know, you, you can't pick up uh, the phone and call the owner of Sennelier in France, but you can pick up the phone and talk to John Cogley. And if he can't answer the question, he'll get his top scientists on the phone with you and say, hey, let's figure out what's going on here. And uh, so, uh, and I find the same reaction from the Escoda family in Barcelona. Yes, I did go and visit with them. They are fabulous, fabulous people. And they have been very, very generous with their knowledge. And, uh, and you know, they're a handmade brush, and I just love the fact that they're a handmade brush. On the other hand, uh, Da Vinci is a really good, top-quality brush, and it's a machine-made brush. It's a German brush, and so it's very precise. So if you want, uh, you know, a really fine synthetic brush, then, you know, Da Vinci makes a really good one. But on the other hand, so does Escoda. So anyway, the point I want to make is, Try several of them. Don't go out and buy $6 million worth of brushes, but buy one here, one there, and try them and find the one that fits your painting style. I use Fabriano uh, paper. I use Daniel Smith paint, and I use a Skoda brushes, not because I think they are the best in the world, although I do, uh, but they fit my painting style. I get the best result by using those, because I've used Raphael's, I've used Trickle, I've used them all. They can all be good brushes if they fit your painting style. So do your own research, find the things that, that work best for you, because in the end, you want fabulous product, obviously. We want to paint paintings that get people's attention and tell stories and show our expertise and and all of those great things. Uh, but also in the process, we want it to be fun. We don't want to be having to fight that brush to make it do what we think it ought to. So, you know, somebody may have told you that that, uh, that number 10 squirrel was a great brush, and it may have been the best brush that person ever used in their life but it might be a train wreck for you. So you may find that a number 10 uh, uh, Raphael might be the better brush for you, even either a squirrel or, or, or something else. Uh, you know, the other thing is to remember that there are so many different types of materials used in all of these, uh, particularly brushes. Uh, you know, you can buy really, really expensive uh, Kalinsky sables, uh, but not for long. You know, one of the problems is, you know, uh, the, the best. Can I just run on like this for a while here? Because I love it. I love it. I love your passion. Good. It's great. Good, good. Well, you know, since the uh, Victorian era, it's been pretty well recognized that the Kalinsky weasel hair is the preferred water brush for all kinds of technical reasons. And uh, the best uh, Kalinsky weasels are in Siberia. And uh, with the political situation we have today, it's becoming more and more difficult to get the Kalinsky hair from Siberia. That's one side of the story. The other side of the story is that the Chinese have taken over the fur business of the world. And so they're buying all of the furs with their tails on them. They don't buy them without them. Uh, and so all of those uh, Kalinsky weasels are being made into fabulous coats for the international market. And a lot of those tails that have, would have made fabulous uh, brushes are being discarded. Now, the, the Chinese are not stupid, so they did realize that they were throwing away something that had value, so they started uh, making, they started packaging Kalinsky weasel tail hair. The problem is they are mixing the qualities. So you might get uh, 
a male uh, hair from thick, which is the best hair, or then, but it may be mixed with a, a lesser quality breed of weasel, and it may be the female hair coming from August. So when you get them together, they don't operate the same way as the male hair from the coldest part of the year. So uh, there's a lot to learn uh, about it. And uh, I don't want to scare anybody, but, you know, there are people like myself that, that have researched all this and we're perfectly willing to share. I've got videos out there on YouTube. I'm, I'm doing a whole series of, uh, of videos for the terracotta people. And one of the first ones I just finished, it had sex, se seven segments. And one of them is all about brushes and how to find the, a good brush. And once you get it, how to use it properly. That's another thing. What you get are fabulous, fabulous brush. Yeah, I mean, that is a fabulous brush. But look at look at the belly on that brush. Look fabulous that 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 brush is. And that's a th synthetic brush. And but you and would, it acts like sable. And it acts like sable. I mean, the, the Escota people are just brilliant at this. Yeah, absolutely. And the balance in your hand is just one. Do, do your do, Gabriel, do your hands ever get fatigued when you're painting? No, I don't. Mine don't because that that brush is so beautifully yeah. balanced uh, that uh, that it's just it, it just it's just an extension of your fingers. Yeah. Yeah. It's just so cool. So there, there's a lot to learn. And uh, uh, I've turned over a lot of rocks. And uh, like I say, I'm trying to get the word out there uh, uh, through the regular channels and through uh, uh uh, the fabulous companies like uh, like Terracotta. So, uh, and if you got an you got a question, shoot me a, shoot me a question. It may take me a few days to answer, and I may be in in, uh, in 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 Scotland when you send it to me. So you may have to wait a little while. But I, I've never failed to answer uh, a question yet. And I'll give you and but <laughs> it always comes with that caution. You asked the question, but Lauren answered the gave you the answer. It's Lauren's opinion only. It isn't the world opinion. <laughs> so good, so good. And I'll put those links for terracotta and all those other things that you just mentioned down in the description. But now people want to know about your painting because you know some people don't even know that they can get your DVD by streamline. And uh, good point. Yeah. So one thing is I know that um, you're not, you would speak to a group of people that are not interested in painting fast, not interested in doing plein air, but your kind of work um, may be for people that they want to be in their studio and, and, and painting a, a wonderful picturesque picture of uh, people's dining wear and whatnot. Can you talk about this? <laughs> how do you, how do you get these amazing photos uh, to work from in these commissions and? Uh, well, I th well, I think I think the start mouth of that... dropping, mouth dropping painting. <laughs> let, let me grab a couple of things over here, and, and I will agree. I am I am a realist painter. I, have, I and I have no no apologies to that. But I'm going to show you a couple of things that I have just just finished. This is, this is the kind of painting that you are talking about. This is a silver service. Uh, and I, I love to, when I photograph, what I do is I go to people's homes and I photograph their collections. It could be crystal. It could be silver. It could be, I just did one of some, uh, some brass pots from Morocco that was just so fun to paint. Uh, and I may take a hundred 200 photographs before I find the right mix because I take along props with this. I mean, the, the, the time I went to this lady's house to do it, she had beautiful magnolia trees in the backyard. So we went out and cut magnolias, but we also had pears and apples and all kinds of other things because you never know what's going to work best with uh, what you're photographing. So I, I pears and uh, 
and and I usually take two or three different types of pears because a Bosque pear may not be as as wonderful as a big uh, yellow pear, and and the, and the red apple may not be as good as a Granny Smith. And so I take a lot of props along with me. Not not terribly expensive, but you know, can you, and you can always eat them. Which is, you know, you haven't lost anything. <laughs> so I'll take a photograph of this and uh, and I do it with a, a very high res camera. Uh, it's a Nikon. And uh, I will then uh, bring it home, put it in my computer, crop it properly to the size of the paper that I'm going to be. Uh, this is a half sheet. Uh, and uh, and then I will project the image using a high res LCD uh, projector. There are a half out there, and uh, and if you go to my website, uh, there there are some listings of products uh, on there that I use. Uh, and then and I do that to get the highest level of detail. This drawing took me about three and a half hours to do the tracing, and then I put it on my painting board, and I spent two more hours looking at a, a large photo of this to get all the detail on the, the edges of the uh, the coffee pot and the, the other and and all of these details in in the uh, in, in the silver uh, and and the lace takes some fair amount of drawing uh, so you know I got I got probably seven hours worth of uh, invested drawing uh, in this uh, but it's because I'm looking for that level of detail uh, and I'll, I'll admit to you, I don't have the photograph I used handy here, but the photo, the silver in the photograph was much darker than this. All you really could see were the highlights. And said painting the silver objects, I used neutral tint. Neutral tint can be a very, very dark uh, black, but the background, of course, is McCracken black, and it is so much blacker than neutral tint, that means I know that while the silver is going to appear silver and dark, it's always going to stand out against the McCracken black. So I don't have to worry about that. In fact, go back and introduce a little McCracken black in the centers of these so there's harmony uh, through the whole painting. Now, I don't always paint silver and crystal. That, that is a, uh, a misnomer out there. Uh, this is the painting that I'm uh, shipping to Fabriano uh, this year. Uh, these are just two faucets that were installed in a house in about up in Wyoming in about uh, 1910. Uh, and they just sat there and they've They've been heavily used. They've got they're patinaed, they're rusted. Uh, and what I try to do when I paint, you know, you paint for your audience. My audience in Fabriano is from all over the world. And so I try to do a painting each year that, of objects that are universal. I don't think there's anybody in the world that hasn't seen a faucet set. I don't care how poor uh, they are out there you know they may not own one but they've seen one so uh the, so the, every year i paint something that i think has a universal recognition and then i try to tell an interesting story about it and the interesting about this is the aging of the of these uh everyday objects and how they've been enriched by the 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 wonderful textures and the uh and and the uh build up of uh of granular forces around it and thank goodness we got all the great granular paints from daniel smith to come in and help us to tell that story so let me share one more painting uh with you every now and then i see something next object about three years ago in a home in mississippi i took a quick snapshot i thought about it and thought about it and thought about it and uh Here's the photograph that I took, uh, highly sunlit uh, corner of a dining room. And this is what I've painted. Wow. What I've added, I, I wanted this to be an enigmatic image. I wanted people to, of course, see this incredible wallpaper and the sun on the 
on the floor, but I added an empty cup on the seat. And so I want you, after you've studied everything, I want you to come back and say, who left that cup? Are they coming back or are they gone for good? I will, those are the kind of stories that you want your paintings to tell your audience. So that's what keeps me going. That is amazing. And people are going to be wondering, what kind of paper did you do for the chair? Is that smooth paper? It can't be cold pressed. <laughs> no, it's it it is soft pressed paper. Uh, Gabriel does know me too well. Uh, uh, I use a soft uh, Fabriano Artistico soft pressed paper, and uh, I'll, I'll just tell you right up there that uh, Fabriano is the only paper company in the world that makes a soft press uh, finish. It's just, it's it's very, very like their cold press. It's just the mountains aren't as high and the valleys aren't as low. So I can do those details without painting up one side of the mountain and down the other side of the mountain. I, there are times that I use cold press. Uh, there are even times I use rust, rough, but not very often. Uh, I would say nine times out of 10, I'm using the uh, soft press paper. It uh, I love the new sizing that uh, Fabriano is using on their Artistico uh, paper. It works really, really well for me. It just uh, it takes the right amount of, uh, of uh, paint right off the brush and puts it where I want it to go. Uh, so you get the right paint that, that spreads the way you feel like it ought to. You get the brush that where the hairs have the right texture and the right point so that it moves out of the brush at a speed that you can control. And then you put it on a, a, a paper that uh, responds uh, the way you want it to. Uh, every color you see in my painting is usually three and sometimes six layers. Because, and I may intersperse some even complementary colors in one of those layers. Because remember, one of the things that, uh, that uh, let, let me get one thing. Amazing, amazing work. One of the things that we need to remember about uh, watercolor, and, and again, harking back to the why the paper is so important. This is the way watercolor works. The, uh, the sun, the, the light source, whatever it is, sun, uh, uh, flood lamp, whatever, goes and it hits the surface of the paper. That bounces back in your eye. And so the surface might be blue. And so the, you get, that's the first color you see. A microsecond later, the light goes through all the layers of color that you've built up here and hit the, the paper and bounce back. And as they bounce back, they collect all of those colors. So you don't know it that it's happening because it happens so fast. But all of the colors that you put under that top layer are going to influence how the people see your painting. So if you're not layering watercolor, you're missing one of the great opportunities of painting in watercolor because it's just about the only medium that has that uh, layering effect. And so uh, even I put a, uh, a base coat under my blacks and uh, for instance, if uh, if I if I'm doing a, a, a painting of just silver and I want it to look very metallic and cool, I might put a blue uh, phthalo blue red shade under that McCracken black, and you're not going to see it because it happens so fast. But you're going to feel the coolness of that metal. But now, if I've got a couple of pairs in there and I want to sort of warm the whole thing up, I may put quinacridone gold as the underpayment uh, layer under the McCracken black. And so your eye will see it and feel the quinacridone gold, but not really, really see it. You're still going to see it as black, 
but it's, it's going to make those pairs just rise up and feel more at home in that painting. That, that's, for me, some of the magic you can do with watercolor that I just don't see uh, in any other medium that's out there. Now, people are probably wondering, you must have a really uh, messy paint palette. <laughs> Do you want me to go get my palette? <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll, we'll leave them something to come look at your All website. Right. No, I, uh, I, I, I'm a very OCD uh, kind of guy. I, I like, you know, even if you look around my, this, this is not my studio. This is my office. Uh, but, you know, everything is where it ought to be. And that's the way it is in my palette. And what, and I, my, where I paint in my studio is like a cockpit. I can reach out with each hand and know exactly where it is. Just like that pilot, uh, piloting that big 747. He knows where everything is. He doesn't have to look for anything. I can just put my hand back and pick up my X-Acto blade. I don't have to think about where my X-Acto blade, where did I leave it the last time? Because it's always right where it's supposed to be. Well, that gives me a really good reason to come to Texas and come see this uh, pick Anytime. Pop. Anytime. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, one thing, um, what is a mistake that most beginning artists are making when they're trying to do your type of art? Well, let, 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 let me give you a, an answer that is, that is universal. This is everybody has this issue. People need to learn how to load their brush. And here's what most people do is they put their brush in the water. They swish it around and the belly of the brush fills up with water. And then they go over and they touch the, uh, the paint with the tip of their brush. And so they're getting some really rich thalo blue on the end of their brush. And then they take it over to their paper and they put it down and then they get a little pressure and they draw it across their paper. And it's looking really, really nice and bright. But what they don't realize, there's only 15% of what they're carrying across the paper. It's pigment. And the rest of it is the water that's rushing out of the belly of the brush. And so 15 minutes later, when it dries, it dries 80% lighter than the color they thought they put down. And so what they need to learn is how to, and there are a thousand ways to do it, but the most effective way to do it is to flick your brush. Just throw the water out of it. You know, it's just clear anywhere. You can do it against the wall. It's going to dry. Don't worry about it. Uh, but, and you got to learn how much to flick. You know, can you get 10% of the water out or can you get 90% or can you get 100%? And you don't want 100%, you know. Uh, if you want that belly to fill up completely, you want about 90% of that water out of there, but you want enough water on the strands of hair in the brush to leach that, uh, that uh, paint up into the belly. So when the belly gets full and then you start painting, uh, that, that the, what's going to come out of there is exactly the color you want, and it will be the same color when it gets dry because it's the, the, the pigment that you mixed and put into the belly of the brush. So uh, I, when I paint, I mix a lot of wells of color of the degrees of the blue that I want. I use a light cerulean in the middle, a thalo blue, and and a, a cerulean at the end, thalo blue in the middle, and a and Prussian, but I'll have several steps along. And so I can just fill the belly of the brush with that pigment so I know exactly what the end result is going to be every time. I don't have to worry about whether it's going to fade 70% or fade 40% or whatever it is. Uh, you know, a lot of that comes with practice, but if, if you know how to fill the belly of your brush properly, then you'll end up painting with the color that you want to have in the end and not see it lighten on you because the, the brush is full of water. And that's true of any way you want to paint, whether you're a, whether you're a, a plein air painter or whether you're a, a studio painter. That's, that is such a key element uh, to know. I appreciate you giving us that knowledge bomb. 
And um, as a as a person that is a global artist, internationally known, what say are some current trends that you've seen leave watercolor and that are coming to watercolor? Well, I think there there are a couple of things that I, I'd I'd like to share with 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 your audiences. Number one is the uh, general uh, growth and in interest in watercolor globally as an art medium. You know, it's been popular for a long time. It's the most accessible of all the mediums. Uh, uh, you can go into any Hobby Lobby and for $27, get started in it. It won't be good stuff and you're gonna to wanna to re replace it soon, but that, that's what it takes to become a watercolorist. Uh, and, and, the, and, and the reason I know this is that I, as, as I, told you earlier, uh, I stay in touch with a lot of manufacturers and a lot of dis distributors of art materials around the world, not, not just the Dan Smith, Escotas, and, and Fabriano people, but lots of others out there. And everybody is sales are going up and their sales in new countries are growing by leaps and bounds uh, because the quality of the product and the accessibility of product in countries like Peru and places like that is pretty limited. So uh, the, the, the manufacturers from uh, China, Japan, the United States who make and, and, and Europe who make the really top quality products are expanding into all those nations. And obviously from that, their sales are growing but their fundamental sales in the countries like the United States that are committed to watercolor are also growing. So we know without a doubt that watercolor is becoming every day a more popular medium and there are more people that are coming in and painting. And what we also know is that more and more people want quality products because those are the ones that are growing the fastest uh, out there. Uh, the, the other thing, and just in terms of what are people painting, uh, the, two, the pe people are painting uh, more realism. And, and that's not just because I like to be painting realism. This is what the, the major magazines uh, tell me uh, out there. The, there. There's a fabulous publication that comes out of London. It's called The Art Newspaper. And it comes out once a month. It's relatively expensive. It's over $200 a year, but they track trends as well as lots of other things uh, in uh, subject matter. And they're the ones that were one of the first people that came out and were saying that there is a huge rise in uh, realism, not only uh, from what we're painting, but what people are buying out there, which in the end may be more important to a lot of people. Uh, so when you, so, and they're looking at Sotheby's and Christie's and things like that. What are selling in those things? And realism is outselling uh, any kind of uh, abstraction uh, out there, hands down right now. The, no, very, very few people are buying new uh, abstract paintings and even uh fewer people are buying uh the you know the uh extreme abstract art and and that's you know uh, a pile of 36 rocks uh dimensions variable you know uh you, we could all argue the rest of the afternoon whether that's art or not uh but it's in all the museums so it has to be art but those are not the things that are, are selling these days and and the, the, the last thing I'd, I'd like to point out is that uh, watercolors are selling very, very well out there. And the price point of watercolors is rising. Uh, there are a number of us that uh, are, are pushing the price point of our uh, paintings uh, higher with every show we have. My, I, am, I have better sales now than I've ever had. The, it seems like the more more expensive they are, more people want to buy them. So I would encourage people to be uh, aggressive in pricing uh, their work. You know, uh, a ten dollar painting is not worth a lot, and so people question whether they should even buy it or not. But if it's five thousand dollars, then they're going to think about it, 
and they're going to think seriously about it. And if they really want it, they'll 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 spend that kind of money. So don't be shy. If you're doing great work, don't be shy about aggressively pricing. I like that insight. And um, people now these days, you know, they want to know how do they get their name or their presence uh, to where they got to get it. And but could you just share how someone started a little later in life, even though they were uh, already an architect um, and they had good business sense? Um how how was that? What did that look like for you? Like I did an interview with uh, someone and uh, they shared that moment when they knew they made it. Uh, you know, was it a painting that you did or was it a show that you attended? Uh, well, it's, that, you? that's an interesting question, Gabriel, because when I was uh, when I moved to Chicago after I left Alexandria, I didn't have anybody to communicate with. Uh, I didn't know uh, any uh, fellow watercolorist out there. And so I, I did sort of get a sense that if you were going to rise up in this profession in watercolor in the United States, you needed to have uh, signature memberships in uh, just a show uh that you have won awards and that you had gotten in shows and all that it, it it it's a blessing for us in some ways in some ways it's a bit of a hardship because you got to go through the process but there's a blessing because that once you've gone through that process there's no question that you are you know uh if you're if you have a signature membership in the NWS the AWS and the transparent and the southern nobody's going to question whether you're a top artist I mean that that's just forget but I didn't have anybody ask. So I, I, I did learn early on. I, I, I used to, I still go to New Orleans on a regular basis. And back then, Dean Mitchell uh, only showed his paintings at the uh, Bryant Gallery in, uh, in New Orleans. And I, I sort of discovered him for myself. So every time I'd go to New Orleans, I'd go and spend two hours just a gaga uh, that anybody could paint as well as Dean Mitchell uh, could. And so I, I, I read a, a, a bio about Dean and it said he had 16 signature memberships. And I, and I sat back and I said, well, that must be what it takes. And so I didn't stop until I had 16 signature memberships <laughs> in Watercolor Society. Didn't know that if I'd had just the right ones, I could have had four or five and not, not have to work. I mean, there was, there was one year I, 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 had, I was in 14 shows I, I, it seems like all I did was ship paintings, uh, but it took me about five years to get 16 signature memberships. Uh, but you, I'm not recommending that anybody get 16 memberships, but, you know, a half a dozen or three or four of the right ones, uh, NWS, San Diego, Houston, uh, those, uh, then you've got the credentials to number one, Go to a, a, a gallery director and say, look, I have, here's proof that I am seen by the peers that paint that I have what it takes. Uh, and, and, and that becomes a really, really powerful tool. And that's a tool that people in Europe, can't, you know, people in England and Scotland do have watercolor societies. I mean, they have Royal Watercolor Societies. So if you have your signature membership in the Royal Scottish uh, Watercolor Society, and that's a pretty doggone good uh, credential. And, and we can actually get those credentials by applying over there. And they can here too. I mean, look at all of our friends like George Politas and people like that that have signature memberships in the American Watercolors Society because they have re realized that in the international uh, community, the signature memberships in those societies has cachet and, and, and proof, proof. And so, yeah, it doesn't happen overnight because almost all of them at least require three. So it takes a minimum of three years, even if you're painting at the top of your game and the top of the market out there. I didn't I didn't achieve all mine in the first time. I had plenty of rejections out there, but I had 
uh, a lot more acceptances. And, and, and it just in that process, it encouraged me to paint more and to paint better. And, 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 just let's talk about one other thing. About 10 years ago, the Chinese discovered uh, American watercolor. Maybe it was 15, but give or take in there. And, you know, fabulous Chinese painters like uh, Zhou Tianyu uh, came in here and were just knocking us off our, our feet. I mean, the first time I saw a painting by Zhou Tianyu, he won best of show in Houston. It was the first time he had ever sent a painting to the United States. And there were a lot of people that were saying, oh my God, we can't let those Chinese come in here. We can't let the uh, Spain, Spaniards come in here. We can't let the people from South America come in here. We got too much competition as it is. Well, we can't keep those people out. That's, that's not what we do here in the United States. So we welcomed them with our arms wide open. And what did it do to watercolor? It raised the quality of watercolor across the United States and around the world. It was the best thing that could possibly happen. And so uh, all those people that grumped about, you know, better painters coming along, I just said, paint, paint more and paint better. That's so good. And uh, we got we got an interview with George Politis and uh, and they talked about how much uh, getting a signature membership with AWS helped them back in their country Absolutely. and how they hold that in regard. And, you know, and some people will just boo on, you know, that uh, close of uh Positivity kind of thing. Well, I will say to those people that, uh, first of all, who think the AWS is just this exclusive little club and, you know, don't even apply because if, if you you don't know everybody, they're not going to select you. When I first time I entered the AWS, nobody knew my name from Adam Saul Fox and I got in and I won an award. You know, the next year I didn't get in, but the next two I did because I realized that second year I didn't give them the best painting that I painted that year. You know, and so if you look at the, the list today of those people that got a painting in uh, AWS, only a third of the people that got in were members of AWS. So, uh, you know, it, it, AWS, like everybody else, is looking for new talent out there. And the new talent is producing some of the freshest, most wonderful things we've ever seen. And those are the things that are getting in the shows out exactly. there. The people that are trying to copy somebody else or do the paintings that are as good as is somebody else, those are the ones that aren't making the cut out there. So be fresh, bring new ideas to the table. Uh, think about the story that you're trying to tell your audience. And if you don't have a story, then ask yourself, why? What? Why am I painting? I mean, what am I, what, what is the message that I would like to bring out of my experience to tell stories that are uh, captivating? And how can I tell them, telling them being the technique I use, how can I tell them in an enticing way? You know, if, if, if you spit it, two cautions. If you send a painting that's just tones of gray and blue to a watercolor society, it's not going to get in because you've got 10 seconds to get the attention of that juror. And if you don't do it in those 10 seconds, he's got 500 other paintings to go through. So that he's going to say it's out. So it's got to have something in it that catches somebody's attention. That's why those yellow. Tulips are in that little painting in the back. And that's why that all that red checkerboard was in that. Yeah, both those paintings got in shows. They want they 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 want awards because first of all, they grabbed the attention of the of the juror. And then when it came back to see it the second and the third and the fourth time, then they have time to, to understand a little bit about what the story is. And if they capture the fact that there's a story at it. It's in for the next round, and it goes through all that. Now, the caution is that you could put a painting in a show that complex story to it that it, if, if you tell a story that's so complex that it takes two to three to four minutes to understand the story, you're going to be wiped out of the show because the jury members don't have that kind of time to spend. 
Those are great paintings. Don't not, don't ever not paint them, but just realize that those are the, the, the paintings that are going to gallery. And when the gallery uh, owner comes in and, and takes somebody to see that painting and tells them about the story of that painting, then you're going to make a sell. Uh, but that's not the same thing as entering a, a, a competition like the ones we're talking about. Uh, I've, I've, I've seen some incredibly fabulous paintings not get selected for shows just because they were just too complex for uh, the, the three or four people uh, that were during the show or the single person that was during the show. If I didn't have five minutes to sit there and figure out what that person was trying to tell me, even though I realized the technique was really fine. But on the third round, I said, nah, I don't have time for this. Well, I hey, Lauren, uh, just curious, do you like that hot press paper? Well, Gabriel, that's, that's a really a, a lovely question because it, it is one of my favorite subjects. Uh, I, 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 as I said, I've been out there and I visited several paper manufacturers, spent probably more time with the Fabriano mill and in Fabriano and, uh, and the people that import, but not only them, but everything. And what I've learned is that Hot press paper was never meant to be a watercolor paper. It was made for the illustration industry. And it was a paper that was uh, formulated to take primarily gouache and tempera. And it is a fabulous medium for that. And I'll point out that uh, I think we're going to see a revival of the use of gouache here over the next couple of years. Just a hint, hint, hint. Watch out for that. And I think that uh, hot press paper will be the preferred uh, paper for that because one of the great things about gouache, it, it dries flat, you know, and, and so you need a flat surface. It doesn't need, it is not going to respond well to cold press and hot press. And so, but if you, uh, and the other great use of hot press paper is ink. Uh, it takes ink beautifully. I mean, particularly if you're doing steel pen drawings and things like that, it doesn't bleed. It does a great job because those fibers are so compressed by 20 tons of, of steam and steel. Uh, and that's why it's called hot press, by the way. Uh, uh, so uh, now, do people use it for watercolor? Yes, they do. Uh, there are some fabulous painters out there that do wonderful things on hot press. I can't imagine the machinations they have to go through to, to make it uh, a work. Now, I, I feel the same way about UPO, but so that's another discussion we could have. But uh, uh, I, think it's, I think it's just interesting to realize that hot press, while it's sold by every store out there as a watercolor product, was never intended by the manufacturer to be a watercolor product. Thank you so much. And I'm gonna put in the link uh, that video that you took so much time and effort into teaching us about the uh, hot press paper and soft press and the different types of cold press and rough paper. Uh, it's very valuable to have knowledge about these things. And so you're not, uh, you know, especially if you guys are uh, trying to dial it in, you know, uh, where do you get your art supplies? Well, the primary re resource I go to when I buy supplies is uh, Cheap Joe's in Boone, North Carolina. Uh <laughs> Joe Miller and his organization down there are just superior. They don't sell everything, but they do sell some of the best products out there at the best prices. Now, if you can't find it at Cheap Joe's, Blick will have it. And Blick is a fabulous store. Blick is the largest online sales store out there. And now we've seen more and more, we can buy things from Blick and from Cheap Joe through Amazon, but I would prefer to buy them direct from uh, those companies. So they'll know that I am supporting their interest because they in turn support all our, our interests. The Blick people do great uh, uh, support of, of uh, the competitions at uh and watercolor societies give prizes, as does uh, uh, nobody probably does more than Joe Miller at that. But you got things that Joe Miller does to uh, to give brushes and uh, 
and, and paint to uh, children's hospitals and things like that that other manufacturers don't even think about. So uh, shop where your dollar uh, goes further than just helping yourself. Uh, and, and there's no place like uh, Cheap Joe's to, to further that uh, influence you'll have in the world. Yeah, you know, Cheap Joe's, they were there for us during the pandemic. They got out our orders. And even if uh, Cheap Joe's has always kept this thing, if you order bucks or more, which is really easy to do with our supplies, they ship it to you for free. Like, holy cow. Uh, I just got this uh, little uh, gorilla uh, from Cheap Joe's. Uh, and, you know, they've got uh, some other specialty products, uh, which is just so amazing. And, you know, I think Blick will probably have your brush set uh, if yeah. you're on the website and look under Master Sets uh, under Escoda. And, uh, yeah, I totally agree. Those are two websites that definitely uh, they get it to you. And if they can't get it to you, they'll let you know when it's in stock to get and it. If we had a locally owned uh, art material store, I would go there first. And those of you that are lucky to have uh, locally owned, and I hope you are supporting them. Uh, there, there's a wonderful uh, uh, store up in uh, Oregon, I think, called The Merry Artist. And it's one of the few places I can find the right uh, tape that I am masking. And so uh, add maryartist.com to your to your list. They're really nice people, and they will turn that order around in a matter of hours. Yeah, and I agree. I like artists and craftsmen as well. Absolutely. Uh, they're a super good location. And they seriously, you go into that store and they don't have that brush, they can have it to you in less than a week. Sure. And uh, yeah, like support local if and if you can't, these other distributors, they they do their best. And so I know you as a very kind, uh, very generous individual. Uh, I had a wonderful experience with you in Italy uh, where we got to just do some amazing uh, fine dining and see beautiful <laughs> things. You know, and people that um, haven't traveled yet. Right. What is there is there there is an importance to travel, isn't there? I think there is just personally. I mean, I've, I've traveled all my life. I grew up in small towns in Mississippi and all I knew was there was a great big world out there. And now that uh, uh, I don't live there anymore, I say Mississippi is a great place to be from. Uh who's flown about 6 million miles on American Airlines. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready to pick up tomorrow and go to whatever the next exciting place I, I can. And there are already probably four uh, international trips uh, on my calendar for this, uh, for 2023 and, and another six uh, domestic uh, trips in that. Yeah, uh, you, you get become pretty stagnant if you're just studying your backyard. And uh, if you're willing and you and you're able, it, traveling is not for everyone. Not everybody can even get out of their house. And I don't want to demean them because there are some fabulous paintings being done by severely handicapped uh, people out there. And my hat's off to them. And we want them to continue to contribute to the uh, the greater body of work because they they, they have something uh interesting and wonderful to, to say and say it in a very intelligent way. Uh, but for those that can travel and go to uh, shows in, in the world, uh, participate in uh, whether you're invited as the, as the instructor or you can just afford to go to uh, France and uh, go to the Dordogne area and paint uh, 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 vineyards. Man, why wouldn't you want to do that? <laughs> That's so good. That's so good. Um, I really appreciate you taking this time and sharing your passion and your love for watercolor. 
Um, I'm going to put a lot of links down description in yours. I want to put the one video you did on how hot press paper is not paper at all and how uh, <laughs> soft press is definitely one you want to look at. And they'll find out that extra white paper is what they're one going to try. So, but well, other that, than yeah, those links, point. where would people get a hold of you if they wanted to connect with you? Well, the easiest way is just my email, and it's uh, Lauren Mac at AOL. It's L A U R I N M C at AOL.com. And I'll put that down in the link. And Lauren, thank you so much. I am still grateful that you taught me how to shell out uh a what was it a shrimp or a crawdad or something it's a crawdad. that is my favorite <laughs> video if i'm having a bad hair day bad beard day i watched that video of you teaching me how to shell uh some a crawfish <laughs> oh, yes that's what it was i just looked over you i got you gotta help me out here buddy i've never ate one of these and you did it and uh, Thank you. I appreciate you. I'm so honored that you took this time. And I well, know you're, you're, this you're, is going to be you're, you're very kind to invite me, Gabriel. You know, I'm a big fan, and I know that you're going places in, in this uh, in, in this big world out there. And we're, we're, we're going to be uh, standing on the sideline uh, cheering for you and for all those people that just wet a brush for the first time. We want them to be on the stage next to us uh, as soon as they can get there. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. So keep watching uh, more about Lauren McCracken, folks. And uh, yeah, watch these other videos that we have for you. Thank you so much for being here. Great to see you. Thank you. Uh, Lauren, I'm just curious. There was this little kind of like story being told, though. Um, it's kind of, you know, it's... It, we talk about it, or I've heard about it in the boys' room. It's uh, your studio floor is kind of messy. My studio floor is my, I don't know what. Uh, the only thing that I could think of is that uh, because sometimes when I my brush is loaded with paint, I flick it in order to get that point back. And so my, my, my. studio floor and the wall on that side and the books books cases behind me are spattered heavily with paint but other than that i don't know what it is that's what it was that was the rumor <laughs> that uh, you go jackson pollock on your uh, studio floor <laughs> well that's why i have this very very dark uh 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 persian rug on there so it doesn't show <laughs> very nice well uh i don't know if that's gonna make it into the video <laughs> doesn't matter all righty gabriel it's been a lot of fun uh you take good care all right well i hope you enjoyed that interview with lawyer kraken i'm pretty sure you're gonna have to watch that another time over and over with a notebook because there are so many good nuggets well we will see you next week have a wonderful week and keep those brushes wet. See you. Take care. Bye.